going to do, I just want to introduce uh, Mike Mannix, the head coach at Wilbraham and Munson, coming off a great year. Uh, won, uh, won the 2020 NEPSAC Class AA Championship. Um, has been at Wilbraham for a few years now. I know he uh, was a runner-up in 2015, and prior to being there, he spent some time at Drexel University, um, Western New Mexico, and also uh, in a video spot with the Indiana Pacers. So, uh, Coach, uh, without further ado, the floor is yours. I appreciate you being here and, and sharing, sharing some knowledge with us. Okay. Thanks, Mike. Can you hear me okay? Yes, you're good, man. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, so first, I, Mike, I just want to thank you for doing this, and, and thanks to Sean Doherty for um, this kind of being his brainchild. I think this is great for us as prep school coaches to be able to share. Um, today I'm talking about uh, high post, low post scoring, and what we do as a program in terms of um, our philosophy in posting the ball, um, and obviously it's based around our personnel. Um, so this year, uh, we were fortunate to have, you know, three um, really solid, really good post players in our rotation, um, getting about 40 points from our four and five spot um, this year. And um, <clears throat> just to start off here, a couple of rules that we have for posting the ball. Some, um, you know, some are pretty obvious, pretty simple. Um, post it as early as possible. And our thought there is if we can get a rim run, if we can run to the middle of the rim, we would like to post it as soon and as early as possible. It prevents the defense from being set up. It prevents things like double teams. It prevents things like um, digging down in the post, any sort of trapping. Um, another time that we look to post uh, immediately after a ball reversal, um, as the defense is moving, as they're changing sides, as closeouts are taking place on the perimeter, if we can throw it into the post, into the low post right then and there, we're probably at an advantage. The defense probably is, is going to have to sprint or, or come from a greater distance to try to double or dig or whatever they might want to do. Um, we always want to enter it away from the help. So if you're making a pass from foul line extend, extended, um, wherever you see the help sitting in, obviously throw it away from that help. Um, ball fakes and pitch backs. That was really beneficial to us this year. Um, and we had a few more quick hitters sets that involve ball fakes and pitch backs um, because we were seeing more double teams in the post um, when we would try to screen, whether it was a guard to big screen or a big to big screen, we were seeing at least temporary double teams. So the ball fakes, you know, can make the defense shift um, immediately. It's usually just for maybe like a second or two. But just that shift or making the defense pause can then help to create that, that post entry look. And then with a ball fake, sometimes we also like to use the pitch back, or we might, you know, if the ball's here kind of in the middle of the floor, we use the ball fake, we pitch it back. That's when you might be able to get that immediate dump down right there for a quick score. Um, and then we always emphasize with our low post guys, um, bigs, stay on top of your man. And at all times, you know, we try to incorporate some sort of screening, and sometimes it's even bluff screen. Um, so what I mean by that is, like, just kind of an example. Um, actually, I'll use over here. So we might have some sort of action here um, with a guard coming off, and, and here's our post. Ball's here, and, you know, we could send another guy through this way, and what we're going to do is have our low post guy just kind of walk his man in almost like he's going to set that baseline screen for this guard. But really, he's just walking his man in to stay on top of him and do as much as he can to try to seal him here so we can throw it in. So that's kind of what we mean by it's a screen, but it's, it's probably more of a screen to try to get that post up than it is necessarily trying to get the ball here for, for some sort of shot. But whatever we can get out of that is just kind of a bonus. Um, so that's the big stand on top of his man for a bluff screen. Um, that's for the low post. Um, when the ball's in the low post, a couple rules, again, a couple things are pretty obvious. Um, we ask all of our guards to relocate. I know there's um, the majority of the time there's a focus on the guard that actually makes the entry pass to relocate. And that's incredibly important, right? Trying to get a guard that makes an entry pass, maybe from foul line extended, to get to the corner for 
an open draw for three, or maybe get towards the middle of the floor and take some pressure off. But we also like our guys on the weak side to relocate. And that's just because you never, you never know where the help's going to come from. So if they want to leave the guy from the weak side corner and maybe try to double down on the bottom side, then we want this guy to be able to relocate and always try to relocate, you know, where, where um, a big might be able to see. So that's, that's really important for us there, um, relocating all guards that might throw it in. Um, trail, uh, the trail man flares the entry guard. Um, that's one of our rules that we have that's kind of a mainstay. So, um, you know, the ball's, ball's coming down this side. If we're going to throw it in, if we do have our trail man here, was, you know, typically your four man, maybe your fourth guard, a bigger guard, you're going to try to flare here, get this guy off. That three can be open quite a bit, especially if this guy kind of sagged off after the entry pass went in, you might find this guy wide open. And then I just kind of drew that wrong. We like the flare to be more towards the middle of the floor because the rip cut is something else that we have in there. So you can get that flare, you can get the rip. So we always like to flare the guard that makes the post entry pass. Um, clear out the weak side and relocate. Kind of just went through that. And then, you know, post, just, just stay as low on the floor as you can. The higher you're raised up, the more you're going to be pushed out, the more ineffective your posting ability is probably going to be. Um, High post. We were really effective this year in the high post. It, it helps to have, obviously, a really good player in the high post. But we had a lot of versatility at our four position. We were able to do a lot of things. So, um, again, our, our high post, we like um, to run some immediate perimeter cuts, some guard cuts, when we might call for a set that involves high post action. So this year, um, we had some, some stuff that I think was pretty effective with a, a one four set. So if we had the ball here and we're kind of in this traditional one four set that we ran a lot this year, but we either like to throw it to the high post right away and really early coming over half court to try to get like a downhill effect. But if we can't do that, we don't like to dribble side to side too much without any other action. So what we like to do is like this year, we ran a lot of the, the twirl action that I'll kind of drop, drop later. And we might send this guy down. This guy comes off. And all it is is for X4 and X5 to just make sure that they, they're kind of – they're not cheating the play. They have to kind of respect the cuts um, and see, you know, what they want to do from there and, and, and just see the guys um, kind of play off of our bigs. So um, – uh, that's, that's our cuts just to kind of start it. Um, high, low action. Obviously we can throw it into a four or five and they can dive. Um, so the dive there is with the high, low, um, we like the pinch action and handoff action off of our high post, uh, scoring. So, um, you know, pinch post, um, still something that's pretty prevalent in the NBA. I feel like it was a little bit more popular, like in the, mid-2000s when guys like Tim Duncan and, and guys like that were still kind of dominating low and high post, but we really like the pinch action, and pinch action I think is incredibly effective because much like a ball screen, it can be effective, very effective if you use the pinch, meaning like give the ball to the guard, or if you fake it, because a lot of things can happen off the fake. So we'll run action as simple as, um, you know, maybe our four-man here, our five man here, you know, our point is here. We throw it and we run right off of it. And if you can clear out this side, you can get a lot of stuff off of this. And it's really always amazed me. Um, we've gotten beat on it and we've scored off of it where just the defenders here will kind of fall asleep and you can get so much off of the handoff right there and possibly maybe sending somebody back door. There's a lot of action that can happen off of that. So pinch post, handoff stuff, we love. Um, another thing that we run quite a bit that's really effective when we've had, you know, the right guys has been what we call punch action. Um, and we run punch action a couple different ways. We can run it at the elbow and we can run it low along the baseline and along the blocks. So punch action is basically you're, you're just screening for a big 
and it's usually a really quick action that's trying to get them right to the basket. Um, so an example of a punch action would be um, maybe like keeping a big low. So if you if you keep your five man low, you have your four here. He might step out, right? We might hit him and immediately go what we call punch the five. Um, that was pretty effective for us this year. And you know you can punch kind of two different ways. You can make your punch look like this, that straight screen, just kind of you know like just simulating like a a screen right down, just punching, pushing the guy right to the baseline in a quick curl. Your punch um, can also look like a maybe a flex act. So if you have your five man, maybe he's a little bit more versatile, maybe he's a little bit more athletic. You can have him a little further out here, like short corner kind of spot. And when we throw it in here, we might make this cut for a pass, and then we might go into kind of like a flex thing there. We would still call that a punch, even though it's more like a flat um, flex screen. So um, that's our punch action low. We also like to, to run some punch action high. Um, and we didn't do much of that this year, but in years past we have, where again, you know, you're gonna have your, your four man and your five man. And what we would like to do is throw it in, maybe just take the guy away and run straight in to a ball screen for any sort of big or forward that can put the ball down on the floor two or three times that might have a, um, a speed or athletic kind of advantage. So if you have more of a guy that's, that's kind of like a, um, a, a big that's kind of slow, if he has to come out and guard a bigger that's a little bit, um, a little bit quicker, you might be able to get that point guard on big screen and just be able to take a dribble in there and get a dunk. Um, so that's something we've done before. That's our punch action, both low and high. Um, ISO, you know, pretty self-explanatory, throwing it to the elbow. Um, but what we always try to do is a little bit different than pinch post. We'll try to make sure our shooter is opposite in ISO and we'll always try to take the defense away. Um, and our theory there is if you have your best shooter here, you're trying to ISO in this spot here. If we can throw it to this guy and maybe your five and your one go set some sort of a double stagger here, the defense has to pay attention to that. And now you keep this guy here, maybe raise him up a little bit, and you allow this guy to drive the ball ISO, maybe even get a jump shot there or something. So um, those are kind of the actions that we run with high post and, and kind of some of the rules that we have. Um, Mike, did you want me to uh, keep going there? I don't know if any questions have come in. Coach, you, you can keep going. We'll do, we'll do all the questions at the end. Is that cool? Okay, okay. All right, all right. All right, so um, those are our rules. Um, so rules for posting the ball, meaning before it's posted, um, when the ball gets into the low post, these are our rules here. Um, and then, and then high post as well. So now um, I'm gonna go through, I, I, I drew up one or two of them already, but I'm gonna go through some of the quick hitters here um, that have been really effective for us using these rules and going over a couple different actions. Um, so two years ago, um, we started doing a, a lot of rip action and we've run rip action a few different ways. Um, We've run uh, kind of the traditional Golden State rip, rip action, which typically involved, um, you know, Steph Curry um, usually as the screener uh, to try to draw some attention towards him and trying to get some, some quick low post uh, rip action. So typically the way, um, and this would kind of be like a, a, a rip, um, this could be like a rip down situation or a rip back, whatever you might want to call it. It's where you're going to have your shooter here. And what you're going to do is send him through, screen a big that's here, and then make sure that you have another big or forward in this position to then down screen your shooter. And, you know, if you put a really, really good player right there that's hot or a guy that just you know the defense has to focus in on, they can't leave him, and you know again, it's it's going to be pick your poison with that screening action. So if you send your best shooter in here for a back screen, a rip screen, 
then you're going to get that five. So that's kind of the most simple, I think, where you just kind of send a shooter in. Um, but we've, we've done it a couple different ways. Uh, the, the way that we've probably done it most frequently is to send a shooter through to the ball side. So if you have the ball coming down this, down this side of the floor, you have your shooter here, you're going to want to put whoever you're looking to post up on the weak side elbow. You have a good screener here. Um, you have a good, uh, a, a big, I'm sorry, the other big is up top. I'm sorry, excuse me. The other big is up top. You have this big here kind of on this elbow and you have another guard, you know, another scoring perimeter scoring threat here. You're going to kind of dribble that guy through. He's going to come middle of the paint to try to create some good spacing. Your shooter's going to come off. Again, you want to make sure this guy is a guy the defense has to key in on. They're going to pay attention to quite a bit. You also want to make sure this guy's somewhat of a threat that they can't just leave and double off of. And then he's going to come and he's going to get that back screen, rip screen right to here. So that's another way to do it where you're screening a shooter to the corner and you have another guard back screening the big that you're looking to, to rip and to, and to post. Um, and another option, and, and what I'm kind of doing is you'll kind of see the trend here that I'm doing, um, is counters to one specific kind of action and two or three different counters, which I think can really keep a defense on its heels. So the other thing that we've done in the past is whoever we're looking to post or rip, um, we'll put this guy right at the top of the key. And this might be when you're playing one big with four guards um, and, you know, you might have a really good shooter here. You might have another really good scoring threat here. And you got the ball on this side of the floor. You know, you probably maybe you have your fifth guard, um, or you know, your fifth guy somewhere out in this area here. So now what you're going to do is, and all of it's legit, you're trying to score off of everything. You're going to down screen for the two man here. And as that happens, the three is going to back screen um, as the four sets that down screen. And then you rip him immediately. Um, so that's something um, that we'll do uh, on the on the rip action as well. So I have a visitor that just ran in front of the camera here. If you can't tell. Um, so <laughs> that's that's a nice interruption. Um, so those are our uh, <laughs> those are our rip cuts here. Um, so we have rip, you know, rip down or rip back. We also have rip double, um, which was kind of going back. To that initial set where we had um, we would screen the shooter to the corner off another guard we would screen whoever we were trying to get in the low post here so then you have your four or your five man cutting off there for that cut but that's typically our five man in our rip double our four man is out here he's a guy who's a little bit more versatile maybe has some range and then he kind of will space out here and we'll have that rip screener continue up, screen him. And now he's coming off to that free throw line area. Now, what I like about that is on that rip double is it gives you continuity. And so now you have your five men here who might be open immediately. But then after that second rip screen in this area, you have your four man coming here. And even if he stays right there, now you're in a high low look. So even though that's a quick hitter, I feel like you then get some continuity out of it because now you can be in a traditional high-low offense where you might throw here if you don't get it. You might get a ball reversal, a dive, a flash, and go from there. Um, so that's, that's how we've used um, our rip actions in the, in the past. Um, our punch, I'll go through a couple of those quick hitters, um, and that was the, that was the guard. Um, just going down, setting that punch screen or setting that punch screen on the elbow. Um, so what we have here is um, uh, that immediate punch where we would punch the four man. So it, it's whoever you're going to kind of almost try to ISO here or get on the drive. You're going to have your point guard throw it in. And really, we don't waste a lot of time when we do punch stuff um, because we don't want someone to have to hold the ball for very long. So when we're in punch, we're usually not any, doing any misdirection. It's usually let's try to get it right away. And so this might be an immediate punch on the four. 
in a drive um, right there on the four man. So, um, you know, that would be like a punch four. Um, I'm not going to give you all of our, our play calls. I'm going to try to change it up because I see that Dan Sullivan's been on a lot of the calls and he's the master of knowing everyone's play call. So I'm just going to make up stuff here as I go along. Um, and we have things where we punch low. Um, so we might start both guys low, potentially both the, the bigs, and we'll have one flash up. We'll hit here. And then what we'll do is we'll have this guy go right here, set that punch screen like I drew up earlier. So that's kind of that low punch action. So that's what we've got off of our punches. I kind of already drew those up, so I'm not going to spend too much time on those. Um, our twirls, and this kind of goes off of our high post rule, where if we can't throw it into the high post going downhill right away, then we like to get some kind of twirl action. Um, and when we we were really successful, I think, for part of the year, um, running our twirl action. So again, you know, you have your bigs here, and then you know you're going to have your guards out here. Hopefully, everybody's got the ability to, to knock down the shot because then you can't really cheat things too much. We might send a guy here in our twirl action. Um, then here come the the screens and those on the twirl cut, almost almost kind of like an Iverson cut, but going low instead of um, instead of coming up high and, and twirling it that way. And you know, trying to hit here, and now you have the ability to kind of play some high low stuff. This guy can dive off the twirl action. Um, we also, you know, we we ran a lot of high low offense this year, which was really effective. And so, anytime, almost anytime we were in a quick hitter, we wanted to see if there was some sort of action that then gave us the opportunity to have continuity within a quick hitter. And I think that can be very key to having an effective offense because while it is a quick hitter, if you can transition from your quick hitter into some sort of continuity, um, it, it gives your players some confidence if something stalls out. And I think we've all seen that as coaches. You have a quick hitter that might, you know, uh, might supposed to all happen within the first 10 seconds of a shot clock and the ball, you know, the ball gets stuck somewhere. Either it gets stuck in a guard's hands or it just stalls out for some sort of reason. Well, if you have a secondary action that can get you in con into some sort of continuity, um, then I think your players develop, um, develop a lot of confidence out of that. And that's huge that they have confidence in your offense, of course. So in our twirl action, um, we would go, you know, make those twirl cuts here. This guy, you know, he could empty out or he could stay, whatever the case may be. And if the ball then goes to this side or goes to either side we would have the ball side big screen across we would get this cut here and then he would pop back and now you have a guard or you have a big excuse me that's curled to the rim you might get a quick look there and you have this guy that would pop out then you can always do that opposite too or we've had what looks like your big might go for the screen across and he might actually kind of do more of a slip. And then you have this guy pop out, you hit here, and you go. And we found that this year, having two really effective low post guys on the floor at the same time, which we did almost always, and one extremely effective forward, a four man that could pop out, um, the slip action wasn't something that we kind of experimented with too much in the past. But when you're running a 1 4 high, and you have slip action incorporated into where you might usually do a cross screen, it could bring it be incredibly effective. And if you have really good size, which what you know, which was what we had this year. I mean, we had like six eight here and six nine here. You know, you're gonna get a lot of easy baskets on those slip situations, even in a one-four high low kind of set. Um, so those were our twirls. Um, where we would screen across, we would dive, we would do um, different things like that. So that was all of our, that was all of our twirl action. Um, and then we didn't exactly do the traditional kind of floppy action. Um, like, you know, I think the NBA has been, um, been using for a long time and, and still uses, even though you don't see it probably quite as much as you did, again, like maybe 10 years ago. 
But for us, again, it, it was really effective. And we used the floppy action in a lot of different ways. Um, so we would do all we could to really try to position our best shooter um, as he's running down the floor here uh, to try to come out, you know, for what could look like an, an open jump shot for some screens. So what we would do is take one big, put him in this area. Um, again, the, the ball's maybe on this side of the floor. You have your other big, um, you know, you could do this different ways. You could have your big walk into the paint here, or you could have your big stay out. Um, we prefer most of the time to at least have him a little bit in the paint so we were never screening too far out here, and this would allow for any sort of trap. So just my, my feeling, my opinion, was get your ball side big in floppy action, uh, and what we call our floppy action, to take one or two steps into the paint to create some space. So now we take our other guard, and we just usually want this guy to be like your tough guy. that's not going to be afraid to set good screens. And he could either be in or be out. And that's where I say our floppy, um, I guess, kind of varies um, or might, you know, might break away from kind of the traditional flop. So you might have your, your bigger, stronger guard in here. And now you almost have, you know, you have this like triple screening action. You have your shooter coming off. Now you have some options. Um, you can have your four man just kind of do the traditional like turn around here screen this guy, he comes out, then maybe he flashes. And again, we went into a lot of high low. So that was one option. That's kind of like your traditional floppy. Now in floppy uh, with your five man here, that goes into one of my original rules for entering the ball into the post. Have this guy walk his man in, sit on top of him, and then turn and seal. And hopefully you can throw that probably low side. So that's your traditional floppy look that we would go with. Um, you know, then obviously you start to see teams adapt. So this is where your counters come in. Um, and this is what I like a lot about, and colleges do it, of course, too, but NBA is big in counter action. Um, so with your counter action, you might now have almost the same kind of like play call, but you're going to change it up a little bit. So... You might have your five man here, again, walking in to screen. Your four man's probably in the same spot. But now, your guard, that's the screener, instead of him starting low, maybe you have him start out here. So now that just gives you a different look. Now you have your shooter coming off. Again, kind of like this triple screen. But now for a counter, what you can do is have your five man almost take another step in to create some better spacing. Have your three man follow his screen from the two and go screen the five man. Now the five comes back to the ball. So it's almost like your five man has his back to the ball. The three man is kind of higher than him. And as he steps into the paint, you now have the three man coming in on his backside to kind of pin his guy. And the way we looked at that being most effective is that had to be really quick. So what we said in that situation was, that's almost got to be similar to how we run our punch. So if you're going to run the guard to big screen and the guard is going to screen the five man here, curl that and try to get it quick. Curl that and try to get it really quick. And if you can't get it quick, then with most of our floppy actions, we would have our weak side big come up here. And again, now you're in high low. I don't be kind of repetitive, but now you're in high low there. Um, and then the, you know, the other thing we did off the of floppy, kind of a, a more traditional thing, was um, just another counter. We would just go with a cross screen. So after you sent your shooter over, um, if we felt like, um, you know, it's the same thing with our twirl action. We would screen across when we felt like, um, you know, maybe the other team had some guys covering our four and our five that would just create mismatch, you know, obvious mis mismatches. So if you have, um, you know, like a, a bigger five man and your four man kind of has like a fourth guard on him or a smaller forward, you know, if X4 is a smaller guy, now as you go screen across, if they're a defense that switches, then you have this big coming over for the ball and you have X4 
who's a smaller guy switching on to that big. And again, if now, you know, more of your guy that's kind of like that, you know, plotting, you know, kind of big five man, um, if he switches on to your four, you bring your four out here and now you can play through him as well and take him off the dribble. Um, so those are some of the sets um, that we ran out of flop. Um, I'm going to talk about um, some drills now that we do. I figure I, I kind of wrap it up that way um, with some drills we do that I feel like um, are somewhat traditional, but um, almost all the drills I'm going to talk about kind of have a um, like a going live element to them. Um, so, so it might be just a guy with dummy defense, um, you know, or, or no defender at all first to try to get it, try to get a feel. Um, but they do have some sort of like live element that's kind of incorporated, um, with the exception of the first one I'm going to go through here. So, um, and I feel like we've been pretty effective in developing post players. And, um, I guess before I get into the drills, just quick philosophy on post players. It depends on, you know, where we get guys when they come in. Um, if we get a junior, let's say, uh, you know, um, maybe a guy that's, you know, an upperclassman going into an upperclassman um, that seems to be pretty good around the basket, then, you know, we're going to do a lot of fundamental things with him around the basket. We're going to do a lot of live things with him around the basket. Um, but we might, you know, we might kind of uh, move the priority in his development to what whatever, you know, he might not be great at and spend some more time on that while still trying to make him dominant back to the basket. So in this case here, this is a five ball drill. We call five ball and we usually add in same pivot. And what I mean by that is we're always going to like to do the same pivot move for all five balls in this drill. Um, and that, in my opinion, just creates um, muscle memory, I guess. So we typically set up balls, you know, depending on how far away we're looking to kind of put the balls and what kind of move we're looking to make. We, we typically like kind of mid post moves, I guess. So we'll kind of use like the dead spots here. We'll use elbow sometimes a little bit in from the elbow maybe. And then we'll use a middle of the floor spot for your one, two, three, four, five spots. And we'll, you know, we'll typically say like, Hey, you know, we're going to do this drill. You know, we have a couple post guys going through the drill. We're going to do this drill for, you know, maybe six or seven minutes of our 20 minute post breakdown. Um, then we'll just say, you know, today's going to be, you know, all reverse pivot day. So we can get that guys can, you know, we don't complicate things by teaching one pivot for a minute and a half, teaching the next pivot for a minute and a half. And we'll typically do that for two days in a row. So we might do like Monday and Tuesday might both be, you know, uh, reverse pivot days. Wednesday and Thursday might be front pivot days. And then, you know, whatever our next practice might be, if we have one, you know, that, on that very fifth day, um, then it might be tying it all together and kind of testing the guys a little bit more, putting them through game speed, calling out moves as they catch the ball, things like that. So here it's, you know, whatever pivot we might be using that day. And it's a combination of, um, you know, it could be just a, a, a rip and go kind of move. It could be a jab, a crossover step with a rip and go. Um, I know uh, for mid post stuff, even though he's been out of the league for a little while, um, I showed a lot of our guys film on uh, Al Jefferson. He used to play for the Celtics and, and, and Timberwolves and had a bunch of good years in the league. I know um, I always really admired the way he played mid post moves um, and was really effective kind of in this area here where we have the five balls. So. The guys go, you know, they typically start under the basket and we always have them go back to under the basket after every move. And we always have them come out and come out and, and we just concentrate on, or we focus on having guys, um, you know, kind of even feet, even shoulders. And, you know, I, I'm not, I'm not dead set on like, you always have to jump stop to catch the ball. Some coaches do, they like you to jump stop and snatch it up. Um, I don't always say, you know, you don't always have to necessarily take that jump stop, but if you have a defender on your back, you know, you have to see if he's going to push you, is he going to, you know, kind of displace you. I kind of leave it up to the guys to kind of make up their mind there, how they're going to actually get to their spot. But the last thing that we concentrate on there is um, always 
bending from the knees, don't bend over at the waist. And it's amazing how many young post players, the first time you roll a ball to them, the first time you're ever, you know, working out with them or, or, or whatever, they, they go to the ball. And if you, if you throw a low bounce pass, they immediately try to go down from the waist and you lose your center of gravity and you get pushed off. Um, so we concentrate on bending from the knees, not from the waist, snatching it up, and then we go from there. Um, and they do all five moves at once. So, you know, you might have um, a segment of the drill that's, okay, five ball, reverse pivot, and everything's going to be rip and go, or everything's going to be jab, crossover, step, rip and go. Um, and that kind of creates, I think, some muscle memory there. We have the Cartwright drill, um, which I think our guys feel like, um, I've always gotten the feeling and feedback from them that they really like this drill, and especially a day before a game, um, although we sometimes try to limit contact the day before a game, like Coach Hart had said previously, um, the Bill Cartwright drill uh, simulates basically going live in the post one-on-one. -on -one. Um, and what it does is you have your offense starts here on the end line. You have your defense starts on the elbow. You have your coach here with the ball. As soon as the coach slaps the ball or says go, the defense is sprinting down to the baseline. The offense is sprinting to the elbow. They have to get to their lines. So they, he has to get to the free throw line. He has to get to the baseline. They have to touch it with their foot. Once you do that, now it's just basically the offense is seeking position as low as he can go. And the defense is going to try to push him out as far as he can go. So the key in this, and this is what we love teaching is get to your spot as soon as you can, because the sooner you get to your spot, the more of an advantage you're going to have. So if you're the offense and you get to this spot a lot quicker than the defense got to the baseline, now you're turning around and you're sprinting at them. That's the next step of the drill. You're turning around and it's totally live after that. As soon as you hit that line, he's turning around, he's seeking his guy, if by chance his guy is really slow and, and is still getting to the, the baseline, well, we just throw in and get a score. But typically, the race, so to speak, right, is really close. So you have the offensive guy turning here, looking to sprint in and create a sink and seal. You have the defense coming, and, and they're going to collide. Just like, you know, just two big monsters just going at each other are just going to collide. And now the offense, you're telling him, sink him as far as you can. Turn and seal. Coach throws it in. It goes live. Defense. Try to beat him to the spot. Push him out. Obviously not with your hands. We try to avoid foul trouble. But the further you can meet him out here, the less you have to worry about pushing him. So that's our Cartwright drill. Um, you know, we go live after that. Every time we go live in a Cartwright drill or another drill I'll show you, it's always live until offense scores or defensive rebound. And when we're keeping score in our post drills, um, you know, we like to keep score for both makes and stops. But if you give up an offensive rebound, you lose one of your points that you got from your stops. So if you have two stops in your win category there and you give up an offensive rebound the next time, not only do you not get a point for that possession, you actually lose one from what you had in your, in your tally. So that's our Cartwright drill. Um, another one we have that's, not technically live, but has a bit of a live aspect to it, is what we call post-score find or posted score it find it. And, and what we have in this drill is you have your big, and you can start it any way you want. If you want to start him here running in, or you want to start him under the basket, however you want to do that. It could even be, you know, off a screen and roll to the basket. Um, we have him get to a block, and you have a coach here, and you have a coach here. And both coaches have balls here. So now what you have is your big coming in, right? He's got a post it. So we talk about run to the rim, turn and seal your guy, get wide, post up right there. The coach throws that in, make a move. This is a drill where we probably have dummy offense too. So meaning we have another, another big that's just kind of playing like 50% defense on him, playing behind him. Maybe even we say, you know, kind of play on the high side so we can get used to that. Coach throws it in on the first, the first post-up attempt. Throws it in. He scores it. 
immediately after his score, you got to have someone knock the ball out of bounds or, you know, you can have the defensive guy or whatever catch the ball. As soon as he scores it, the coach is awaiting the, the coach on the weak side, second side, is waiting about a half a second, and he's throwing it in. Usually some sort of lob pass. We don't usually do a bounce pass because that's probably, you know, not so realistic as a game. So you score it here. Now, as the big who just scored it, you're underneath the basket. You now need to know you need to go look for the ball and locate it. Coach throws this in almost some sort of like lob pass. And you might give the guy a little bit of credit, you know, a little bit of an easier one to start where you might throw kind of like a lollipop pass and put some air under it. But this guy has to locate it in the air, catch it, score it right away without any dribbles. And that's been effective, um, especially for our guys that, that typically are, you know, but, you know, great majority of low post guys. You want them, you know, they have to be versatile. They have to be able to score in different ways around the basket, not just dunks, not just post-ups and good footwork. You've got to be able to mix it up. So we tell guys, if you can just find balls in the air, a ball gets tipped, or maybe there's a skip and you're coming across the lane and, the, you know, the guy threw an early pass, you got to be able to find it, catch it with two hands, know where you are on the court, Hopefully you don't have to dribble. You can turn around, seal your guy, and, and get a quick dunk or quick layup. So that's our post it, score it, and find it drill. Um, and then the last drill I'll give you is what we call our face-to-face -face live drill. So you have a post guy here. Uh, we'll say he's offense, right? So we'll say five, and then call this guy X5, I guess. They are lane line. They start just above the low block. And they are literally face to face. And you can have multiple coaches, you can have one, you know, multiple passers, you can have one passer. If you just have one coach, say one passer, he starts here on the wing. And or no, I'm sorry, typically, typically you have two passers in stroke. I'm sorry. So you'll have a coach here with the ball and another passer here. As soon as the coach says go or slaps the ball, again, these guys are face to face. You have the offensive player. Take his bottom leg, if you're going to teach, you know, posting up and trying to seal and get position the way we do. He takes his bottom leg, his bottom foot, and he swings it over. So if my lane line is here and I'm the offensive player, coach slaps the ball, I'm immediately taking my low leg, and I'm going to attack my defender's top side. And I'm going to try to get position in there. And then we go live from there. So we teach the defensive guy, hey, look, he's going to get you sealed to some degree. Fight it. And in this drill, we also teach some post defense. So I won't go into that now, but we teach the angles where we like to three quarter, where the ball is, where we say play behind, and where the ball is where we want to say, you know, we're going to front, um, we're going to red the post. So, um, you know, that drills live. And the big thing there is footwork, getting that bottom foot over the top. Um, the coach right here, you know, like I said, it's live as soon as he slaps the ball. So if this guy's able to get a great duck in with his back to the basket, the coach can enter it right there for like a high low. And that's good for us simulating the offense that we, you know, we like to run. Um, if you can't get it in immediately here because this guy ducked in and X5 did a good job of either three quartering or fronting and, you know, took that away, X that pass out. Then the coach throws it over here to the other passer and you have this guy continue to seal. So just kind of drop his foot down. So as he went to attack the top leg, if he couldn't get it right in here from you in the middle of the floor, the ball swings over, he drops his bottom foot. And we're really big. We talk about a drop step in the post all the time, but we talk about drop stepping quite often without the ball. So if you can drop step here, now you get that seal, you catch the guy on your backside, and you get that throw in, and hopefully you get a quick make. Um, so those are our drills. You have five ball, same pivot, but you can change that up. We have the cartwright drill. We have the post it, score it, find it drill. And then we have our face-to-face -face live drill. So um, I hope this helped today. Um, I hope, um, you know, I hope you found it effective. And I, I tried to stay organized here with our rules for before we post, um, when the ball gets into the post, then different rules for low and high post, some quick hitters and some drills. Um, just kind of a quick glimpse into how we look to develop our post players, how we look to help them score, 
and actions that we run that have been really effective. Cool. So. Coach, th thank you. That was, uh, that was really good. I appreciate it. It's really interesting to me to see, like, I feel like um, obviously all the success you've had and coming off winning the championship and, and, and being like with the traditional two bigs, it seems like everybody's kind of gotten away from that. Um, yeah. You know what, Mike, I'm glad you said that because I, I meant to make that point earlier. You know, it was, um, you know, I, I, I only worked for one year in the NBA um, yeah. and it was, it was a long time ago, right? 2003. <laughs> yeah. Um, but the thing that I took from the NBA is, um, now I worked under uh, Rick Carlisle, mm -hmm. who was the head coach of the Pacers at the time. Um, and that was a season, just uh, luckily for me, where the Pacers had a fantastic team. Our team won 60 games that year. Uh, Jermaine O'Neal was, I think, like maybe third in the, in the race for MVP voting. Um, Ron Artest was probably had the best year of his career, arguably, that year. Right. Yeah. yeah. Um, he, he, we, we were, we managed to keep it all together that year. Um, you know, Reggie Miller was still, you know, still had really good ability. He was definitely on the backside of his career, but was still making shots. Um, but anyways, um, what I learned from coach Carlisle from, you know, just working with the Pacers that year was, you know, he, we, you know, we could have played fast. He had, you know, he had kind of a different team in Detroit that he had left, but when he came in and he saw like, look, I have a big, a lot of people won't remember this name, but Jeff Foster was our starting five man. And he was a guy that really like, you know, Jeff was a great player, team captain, but it was like, Jeff's going to get you. He was almost like a Dennis Rodman ish kind of guy. If he got you six points, that was fantastic. He just wanted to make sure that he got you like, he was a poor man's Dennis Rodman. Mm -hmm. Wanted to make sure that he got you like nine and 10 rebounds. You had Jermaine O'Neal who was fantastic in the high post. Mm -hmm. and really good in the low post with his turnaround jumpers. And then you had big guards, you know, so even if you had Jermaine, you know, kind of playing like a smaller five, you could play Ron Artest at the four, you could play Al Harrington at the four. And, and Coach Carl basically just said, here are the weapons that we have. Nothing's going to change, right? Mm -hmm. Like um, short of like making some sort of trade that's really going to change our makeup of our team, nothing's going to change the offense that we, you know, the offensive weapons that we have and what we should do. And so that year, it was a different era of the NBA too, of course, but it was, we scored a lot off of UCLA cuts, right? Like UCLA cuts, that's, you know, a thing that's not used very much. Um, they had another action that we called Hawk action where it was, um, and I'll, I'll draw this up actually really quick. Hawk action was when you had a, potentially like a big guard or a big forward that had a mismatch and you would have your point guard bring the ball down the side of the floor. And it was just like a UCLA cut, except there wasn't any pass involved to initiate it. It was your big guard here with his defender on him. And then you would set this back screen here and you would post up the big guard and you would do that in the first, usually six to seven seconds for the shot clock. Um, so we ran Hawk action. So, you know, this year we had two bigs, uh, very mm -hmm. similar to what we had. Um, you know, we had a couple different bigs back in that, uh, season of 2014, 15, and we were really effective, um, mm -hmm. in, in high post game this year, we were probably a little bit better in the low post than we were in 2015. Mm -hmm. So we did, you know, we worked in the low post a little bit more, but yeah, we used two bigs, and, and we ran a lot of high-low stuff that you don't see a whole lot anymore. But my philosophy is, you know, you you don't necessarily have the ability to, um, you know, handpick your team. Right. Right. So, um, you know, you go out and recruit, you do the best you can. But, you know, what you have sitting in mm -hmm. front of you, right, as your team on, you know, November 10th or whatever you start practice, like – it's your job as a coach to take those guys and you don't talk about, Oh, I wish I had this or I wish I had that. Mm -hmm. Who do we have? What can we do? Yeah. Um, that's interesting. And, you know, I'll say this, we played two bigs and you know, if you watch this on film, you would say, yeah, there was a bunch of teams in class double A that played faster than Wolverine once. No question mm -hmm. about it. Yeah. But if you look at our field goal percentage, it was pretty high. Mm -hmm. And if you look at our field goal percentage in the paint, it was really good. So for us, it was like, guys, don't worry about playing fast. 
Mm-hmm. Let's just score all the time. Right. You know, and we, right. we average, be more effective. You know, yeah. like, like I said, I think at the beginning, the three big guys that we had combined, I think those guys averaged um, uh, like 40 to 41 points per game. You know, which which you don't see a lot anymore. I like the four or five positions. Yeah. So, Coach, I just got a couple questions for you real quick. Sure. Um, first one, so you talked a ton about offense. Um, I'm just curious, like, because you kind of – based on what you were just talking about, a lot of teams are playing more, you know, four guys that are out handling the ball. Like what adjustments do you have to make on defense? Like, you, you know, you get your advantage, you know, you're playing with two bigs, but you know, how does it affect you defensively? Like maybe if you're bigs, you know, teams playing four mobile guys and you're playing two traditional bigs, I, you know, I'm just a bit curious on that, how you adjust. Yeah, I, I think uh, that's a great question. And that was a question that we wrestled with all year long. This year. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and it had a lot to do with the start that we had. You know, we, we didn't have uh, the most impressive start in the world. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I think what you have to do is, uh, I mean, as a coach where, you know, you one of your main jobs, of course, is to put your team in the best position to win, right? And you're also, you know, you have to keep in mind you're, you're, not, you're not really trying to sacrifice your player's development um, in order to win, but – you know, you also have to balance, like, guys don't want to sacrifice their development. Most, you know, most colleges are going to play man-to-man, so you have to mm-hmm. instill those principles. Mm-hmm. You have to try to teach that. But at the same time, if you're getting torched, you have to look at your guys, <laughs> and now you're saying, you know, when guys aren't winning, they're not very happy. Right, yeah. When they're not happy, it's a little harder to motivate. Yeah. Right? And now you see these guys out on the court that are unmotivated and not happy, so now it's like, okay, you know, I think you go to your team. Mm-hmm. I think is a big part of it. And it's like, okay, let's be really honest. Let's take a look in the mirror. What are we capable of doing? Are we capable of playing better man-to-man defense, you know, even though we have two bigs and three guards and sometimes we're, you know, we have some mismatches. We could still do a little bit better. But at the same time, let's talk to our team about what other thing do we want to have in our back pocket? Mm-hmm. for a second defense or you know it could become your primary defense right you know and so this year at times zone defense did become our primary defense right that was the that was the first time I'll say I think this past season was my 19th season in coaching and I think this was the first season ever where zone was looked at as close to being our primary defense um, and certainly for a segment of the year it was our primary defense mm-hmm. and it even helped to win us some playoff games. Um, cool. So having the zone, but with the, you know, if you want to stay man to man and you think that, you know, you're just a hair away or, you know, a, 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 an adjustment away from being better with man to man defense. What I would say is, you know, are you, how are you getting beat? Are you getting beat on getting spread out? Which a lot of times mm-hmm. happens. How do you adjust off of that? So now is it going to be, almost like a more like a pack line approach if you're getting spread out where you're going to say, okay, we're getting killed on the drive. Let's, let's make them beat us on the three. Maybe our length will be able to help us contest shots. Mm-hmm. Or are you getting beat on ball screens because you're getting put in these temporary switch situations? Then I would say, well, the answer there might be a little bit more evident, not that it necessarily will work right away, but you might have to start blitzing trapping more. Mm-hmm. And, and, and getting them to kind of throw the ball around, forcing some turnovers, do things like that. You know, so I think yeah. you got to, one, you got to have a secondary defense ready to go. And two, right. you, you know, you basically, you have to make, you have to make the opponent change the way they're playing. You can't just be like, hey, we're going to step it up and everything's going to be fine. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, that works to a degree. But like, if you're getting torched, it's going to be like, okay, not only do we have to step it up, but, you know, we have to make some adjustments here to what we're doing. So, yeah. Cool. All right. Last one, coach. Um, so, sure. and this is just interesting to me. Like, I, I think as, uh, as coaches, we're always trying to make sure, uh, you know, guys are happy and because when they're happy, they're going to play hard, like you said. So I, I feel like, you know, the way kids grow up these days, especially guards is they, you know, they're growing up in an era where the three point shot and handling and, you know, just the, the low post game isn't emphasized as much. So I'm curious, is there anything you do, you know, you got guys come to you, for your guards, like, how do you get them to buy into this? Because it's probably something they're not totally used to, right? They're not it's probably totally not used to like constantly throwing in the post. And, you know, I'm just curious, like things you do maybe to, 
to make them believe, okay, if you throw it in the post, this is still going to help your development and you're going to be successful because of it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> that's, a, that's a tough one. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and that's a tough one, right? I mean, yeah. the, the one that's not obviously fully under your control as a coach is like, let your post players know, let your bigs know, hey, you know, it's it's your responsibility here. Like, we're, we're getting you the ball. Yeah. We're getting you the ball. I, I One of my former bosses, uh, a guy by the name of Bruiser Flint, he used to say, you know, to the bigs, especially when our bigs were struggling maybe a little bit, he'd say, I can't get you any closer. Yeah. I can't get you any closer. Like, we get yeah. you the ball. I can't. And that's what he used to say. It was a great bruiserism. He used to say, yeah. I can't get you any yeah. closer. Catch the ball. You got your back to the basket. You're in good position. Jump over the top of them and score the ball. Score, yeah. Right? Like, easier said than done. So, I think, you know, you let your bigs know, like, hey, you know, we're giving you this. We're giving you this, right? So, what yeah. your responsibility now is make sure you score that thing. Otherwise, these guys are going to start jacking shots. Right, 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 right. You know, but, but I think probably the, the smarter approach there is probably to help your guards – through film and hopefully what they see statistically and just through actually seeing it on the court is if these guys play well, there's no way that you're going to be any less open. Mm -hmm. and, and, I, and I think that's going to be the thing right there that's going to appeal to them the most. Right. And so now then you, you go back to your bigs and you say, now understand what I'm telling these guys. There's a chance that if you guys start really going off, you're going to be doubled. Teams are going to dig, you know, whatever they're going to do to try to adjust to get the ball out of the post. You have to have both eyes open. You can't take a bunch of crab dribbles and get the ball stolen from you. You can't hold right. the ball. You got to be able to throw it out. And I, you know, yeah. It worked for us this year because we had one guy in the perimeter that was an exceptional shooter. And he saw that he was going to be open when our post guys played well. And that happened at times. Mm hmm and with our two guards that were more of, of five guys um, and maybe like pull-up jumpers, those guys saw that the floor sometimes was a little bit more spread out. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, but it was. That's a great point, Mike, because it was different than our guards mm -hmm. were used to playing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, it's – it's, but that's, that's when, too, I think it's important to incorporate the counteractions like we have off the high post stuff. Yeah. Where it's going to be like, look, we're going to have some counteractions that are going to involve you getting the ball. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think it's important to, I guess, give the responsibility to the bigs, let the guards know that you could be more open, but also then having some counter sets where the ball actually ends up in their hand. Yeah. And I think, they, they, you know, they hopefully will become believers. So, but, you know, cool. of course, it's all Appreciate about winning, right? That's the magic. Yeah, 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 yeah. Magic cure Everybody's all. happy when you win. <laughs> yeah, right. All right. Cool, man. Well, I, I appreciate it. I was really good, really interesting. I appreciate your time. I appreciate you supporting our cause by uh, by doing this. Um, good luck, man. Good luck going forward. We'll definitely be following yeah. you. Thanks again, Mike. Thanks, All right, thanks take for putting care. this together. And what you do is, is a great cause. So just keep doing Thank what you. you're doing because I, I see it all the time. Definitely. Thank you very much. Okay. Take thanks, care, Coach. Yep. Have a good one.